Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. I'm so glad you all beat the bicycle race. So would you like to stand with us as we, as we go into worship? Guys are welcome to come forward if you would like to do that. So let's just pray as we, as we begin worship. Father, we thank you. We thank you for who you are, Lord. We thank you for, for what you've brought us through this week. And Lord, as we come together, we ask that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit just to come. Come and have your way. Come and move amongst us. Lord, may we really experience the, the freedom that you give us this morning, Lord. So, Lord, we ask for your presence and your spirit to reign in this place. And we say, come, Holy Spirit, come. Thank you, Lord.
you come and dance with me today from today until forever I'm inviting you into my dance of love I am calling you drawing you asking you to come won't you dance with me let me love you I 
welcome you, welcome you. I'm calling out your name. Won't you come to me? I'm drawing you, pulling you, inviting you. But it's your choice, it's your choice to come, to come and dance with me. we come as we are and we come and we give a heart of gratitude and a heart of praise to you this morning and we say thank you Lord thank you for your grace and your mercy thank you that you are a merciful God thank you for your presence thank you for our oh Lord the ways that you shower our hearts with, with your grace your mercy your love Lord come this morning and say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks, God. So good morning again. Thanks, Darren. Thanks. Glad you're all awake this morning. You should have been awake because you had to get up earlier because of the cycle thing and all that sort of stuff, but Anyways, can we have the notices, please? We would like to welcome all of our visitors and would love to bless you with a free cappuccino. Please meet one of our hospitality team members at the coffee shop after the service. The next Young Couples Evening will be taking place on Friday the 23rd of February from 6 to 9 p.m. in the Willow Room. Please contact Dave or the church office if you would like to join. Our next Evergreens Morning will be taking place on Saturday the 24th of February from 8.30 to 11 a.m. in the Lounge. Please RSVP to Jill at the church office or respond on the response card. Donations will be welcome. You're invited to join a small confidential healing group focusing on trauma, grief, and loss over the next six weeks, starting on Monday the 19th of February until the 25th of March from 9.15 to 11.30 a.m. at Fountain Vineyard. To register, please contact Cheryl Cupido. Our coffee shop, Holy Grounds, is looking for volunteers to help with sales and to be trained as baristas. If you're interested, please speak to Tash. Guess Who's Coming to Bry is happening on Sunday, the 3rd of March. There are many different ways to sign up for this fun event. You can respond on the response card, scan the QR code on the flyer, or call the office and speak to Margie. If you have already signed up, please check to make sure that your name is on the clipboard. You have an option to sign up as a host or as a guest. And if you've signed up to be a guest, please be at church on Sunday, the 3rd of March, to receive the information as to where you're going for lunch. We heartily encourage you to join in on this fun event. This is an amazing opportunity to enjoy some time of fellowship and get to know other members of your church family. Don't miss out. Our annual Easter camp will take place from the 28th of March to the 1st of April at the Kirkwood High School. Come and celebrate 40 years of Fountain with us. The weekend will be filled with fun, friendship and community, as well as life-changing times in the presence of God. If you would like to get more information, please see the flyer or contact the church office. To sign up, complete the form provided through the QR code, Google form link, or on the response card. Just a reminder that all information on events, the church, bank details, contact details, etc. can be found on the notice board at the main entrance. When I saw the guest who's coming to Bra thing, I just had to think of Barry ons gaan Anyways, that went through my head. I just had to share it. Now you guys can all think about it as well. All right, I have one other um, notice before I hand over to Dave, and that's uh, to all the guys, the teen church guys, after the notices when you guys move out, 
Connor's asked, can you please go to the volleyball courts? Apparently, there's a deep spiritual truth that he's got to teach you <laughs> on the volleyball court. Okay, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Give it to you. Thanks, Gav. Gav's uh, just been selected for the over 40s indoor SA team. Eh? Give him a hand, guys. <laughs> indoor cricket, that is. Awesome. Um, Hannah's got something to, just to add to the community announcements. There we go. Sorry, guys. I didn't do it properly last week, apparently. So I'm back to tell you about guess who's coming to Bry again. Um, and I didn't tell Margie. That's why you got the full digital one first. So for those of you who have never done a guess who's coming to lunch of any kind, fires or no fires, what we are trying to do is create a space where you can get to know other people in the church. As simple as that. We just want everyone to have a chance to share a meal together. We find that that is far less daunting or scary than coming to another meeting because there's something special about sharing food and having that time of low-key socializing. So that's our heart of it is actually just to enable everyone in this room and those of the people who aren't here today to get to know each other. And so this time we've changed it up and it's now a braai. It used to just be a lunch. We decided to embrace our South African roots. And so it's as simple as that. If you would like to be a part of it, you can choose if you want to host people in your home or if you'd rather go check out someone else's spot and then you sign up. As they said, there's a bunch of ways of signing up. There's a clipboard at the back. There's a QR code on this flyer, which was handed out last week, Sunday, but it is still in the foyer. There's a whole bunch of them. So you can scan the QR code and do it online. And it's, it's really chilled. If you want to host, you tell us how many people we're allowed to send to you. We're not just going to send the whole church to your house. You can say, we seat eight people, we seat ten, we don't want any children, or we're chilled with our house getting trashed, whatever you decide. And we'll work within those parameters. The only thing is we do say, please don't sign up to host if you can only take like two people because that's awkward. I promise you, if you just get two random strangers in your house, that's the one that feels really tricky. It's way easier if it's at least six of you, there's a bit more flow, you can all chat and get to know each other. So that's our only framework for being a host. Please just at least be able to have a couple people over. And guess if you are single or on your own, and that feels really daunting to rock up at someone else's on your own, you can also sign up with a friend. So you can say, I'm going to be a guest, but I'm going to go with so-and-so, and then we'll send you together. So there's a lot of different ways to sign up. All the information about what you need to provide or what you need to bring with you is on the flyers and all the other places. So if you want more details, you can also speak to myself or Margie. But I just wanted to come and steal the mic today just to let you know the heart behind this thing. And I promise you, it is always fun and it is always worth it. And it means that the Sunday after this bri, when you come to church, there's a few more faces that you know. There's a few more people that feel like family. And so that's really what we're doing. And especially before Easter camp, guys, it's way more fun to know more people before you come camping with us. Because you are all coming camping, right? <laughs> that was pup. <laughs> Is it just me? We literally pitched our tent in the garden yesterday because the kids are amped. You guys better be joining us on this Easter camp. That is something that I can stand on. I've been to how oh, many, 30 something, 20, whatever there have been. It is always worth it. It is always fun. The spirit always moves. Your kids have a joel. You're literally just there to feed them. I'm just doing an Easter camp announcement for you now. I promise you, your kids are just playing and running and riding bikes. It is so worth it, guys. It is the heart of this church. It's what we're on about. And if you want to know about it, you have to come. You have to come to these things that are community values. This is kingdom stuff. Okay. Have I earned my points for the day? Thanks. Okay. He doesn't pay me, I promise. <laughs> Thank you. Right. And uh, just flaying on from that, something else that's very, very much close to our hearts is, um, is a, a heart for mercy. And we have come across a situation yesterday and ready for... Uh, uh, ratified it this morning of a, one of our families in Malabar has gone through a major crisis and we need to raise about a 7,000 rand support for them today. 
in a mercy offering. So the offering this morning, I checked out one to our leaders. Our offering today specifically is to help this family from Malabar. It's quite a tragic situation, and they're very destitute. And if we can raise seven today, that'll help them tremendously. So that's the offering today. It's part of our worship because God's been merciful to us, given, and uh, and it shall be given unto you. And so we we recognise that we have freely received, so freely we give. So can we do that now? The guys, I don't know what this, who's on the team for the offering. Come, Mark. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Casper. Lord, I just pray that uh, you would open our hearts uh, for those that are so embattled and there are people in our society in our community even that are embattled and lord we pray for financial breakthrough that would be an expression of your generous heart towards them so as we take this offering now lord would you release our hearts to do it with a a spirit of of mercy and of gratitude amen thanks guys can send that around okay Uh, Oh, okay, oh, this is a good idea. If you want to, you want to use a snap scan code. It's it's on, it's on the basket there. I think is that right, girl? On each basket, if you prefer, you use, and it's on the screen too. Guys, this is a new deal, new generation here. Yeah? <laughs> snap scan. You can use that if you haven't got cash. Okay. Um, we also just want to say, Karen, may the Lord comfort you with the passing of your grand. It's a uh, not an easy thing to see those generations passing on to glory, eh? but praise God that uh, you, you're here with us too. Thank you for your faithfulness in serving, and may the Lord comfort you. Um, then uh, I also want to just, I don't know if the, we don't have many triplets in the church. In fact, I only know one group of triplets, and are they here today? Would you go all stand for me? The three, that's Emily, Hannah, and Daniel. It's a triplet's birthday today, so we have to mention that. Awesome, girls. Wonderful, eh? I think your dad is so excited about Lobola one day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then just, we had a wonderful baptism last Sunday. I really so enjoyed it. How many were able to see the baptism last Sunday with all those people getting in the water? And that? Um, we're doing one more next week. A guy has just recently come to Christ and uh, he's going to give him, get into the water next week and bury the old man and raise the new. If anyone else wants to join him, there's uh, a queue that will be built up through this week. So come and see, speak to one of the pastors and we'll help you prepare for baptism next Sunday morning after the morning meeting. Um, and uh, I think that's all because today we are so excited to be able to welcome uh, Mike and Julia Day. They have come to us from the UK, but they're actually South African. And uh, why don't you guys come up right now? We're going to take a moment to do some introductions. And uh, uh, come right up here. We're going to give you a mic. How's it? And your little guy as well. Um, We heard about them uh, in the UK, and they were South Africans serving in a vineyard church up there. Um, And Colin and I, on one of our trips, I went a year or two back, was it? it? Yeah. we, we decided to try and connect with them. So when we landed, we went down downtown London and we met in a station somewhere, I think it was a coffee shop there. Yeah. Vic- tra- train station, Victoria train station. We found each other and we had a lovely sense of, of connection and, and fellowship together. And I said, when you come back, cause, and they said they're planning to come back. They, South Africa's on their heart. So I just want you to explain yourself a little bit. What, why is that so important? And where were you raised? Just give us a bit of a backdrop. He's saying I've got to go first. Um, hello everybody, my name's Julia and it's so good to be with you this morning. Um, this is Joseph and... He's reaching for the mic yeah, he's, he's a preacher right talk. there I think. Eh? Um, but as Dave said, we've been living in London for the last three years but just really never sort of lost our love for South Africa and always felt like this was ultimately where the Lord wanted us. Um, and so when we had him, we really started to ask God what was next for us and felt that he was calling us back. So we've just moved back to South Africa, um, and it's so awesome to be home. And we're just so excited about what God has for this nation and, and being a part of that story. Um, I grew up on a sugarcane farm on the north coast of, of KwaZulu-Natal. My family been farming there for many generations. And then I met Mike in Cape Town when I went down to study at UCT. And my background's actually in fashion. Um, I had a clothing business for a while, and that was my sort of um, area of work, but have ended up 
yeah, in ministry, and we've been pastoring a vineyard church in London for the last few years, so that's sort of how we are here today. I'm going to lose the dummy. Um, but we just love Jesus. I love Jesus. He changed my life. Dave wanted me to just share a little bit about how God really met me as a child. Um, and yeah, I grew up in a home that loved the Lord. We were part of a Church of the Nations church, if, if you know what that is. Um, and my parents were born again and spirit-filled and loved Jesus. And so I was exposed to, to the Lord from early on. Um, but when I was sort of eight turning nine, I just entered into an intense, intense season of fear. I became obsessed with death, very, very anxious, was thinking everybody was going to die all the time, just really gripped paralyzed really with fear. It started to interrupt my relationship with school even. Um, my parents used to be very involved with church and they had to sort of step back from being involved in anything at night because I couldn't cope without them. Um, and the one evening my mum and dad had to leave for something and um, I was trying to stop them from getting out the door and I was holding onto my mum's legs and I was just screaming. And she just sat down on the floor, and she looked at me, and she, she said, Julia, Dad and I love you so much. We love you so much. But we can't take this away from you. Do you know who Jesus is? Like, do you know who Jesus is? He, he can take this away. Like, he can change this. And something just went off in my heart that night. I was nine. And I just knew that what she was saying was true. And that night, I, I connected with the Lord in a very real way, and he came to take up residence in my heart. And pretty much from that moment, I just began to experience a very real, life-changing level of peace. Um, and yeah, that was really the beginning of my journey. And, but even though I'd met Jesus in a very real way, I still had these big questions around, like, who am I? And I just constantly felt like I didn't fit in. Um, and... My parents were amazing just around getting us to speak directly to the Lord, to have conversations and to hear his voice. And, and I used to say, I don't know where I fit in, and I feel like I'm outside of all these different places. And they used to say to me, just ask Jesus to tell you who you are. Just ask him to tell you who you are. And I used to get so frustrated because I used to say, he's not saying anything. And I've been asking for two years, and I can't hear. Um, and eventually, when I was about 11, 12, I went on a, we went away on a church camp, like your Easter camp. You never know what's going to happen. Um, and I, um, for some reason, the little kids were included in the youth. And we had a guy ministering to us as the youth. And he started saying the one night, he just said, there's somebody in this room who needs to know that it's okay to laugh if somebody prays for you. And I remember hearing that thinking, oh, my God. I will never do that. Like, that is so rude. You know, why would you ever laugh if somebody's praying for you? And um, anyway, as is God, um, this girl comes up to me afterwards and she says, I just feel I need to pray for you. And that had never really happened in that setting for me before. And I was a bit intimidated. But anyway, I said yes, because I was actually quite compliant in those days. And um, so she laid hands on me and started to pray. And as she prayed, I felt this like rumbling in my gut, and I like tried so hard to stuff that laugh down, and eventually I just couldn't, and this laugh just explodes out. And as I start laughing, I start crying my eyes out at the same time, and just sobbing and laughing and crying and laughing and crying and laughing. And as this is happening, I have what I would now call an open vision, but I see this room in front of me, and um, I could describe the texture of the floor, and the curtains was very, very clear. And I sense the presence of God in front of me, but it's too strong to even lift my head. And as I'm before the Lord, I hear him say, Julia, you've been asking me who you are. You are mine, and I've called you by name. And I hear him say to me, you are Kala Lega. <laughs> and you'll cry and laugh your way through all your days. And when I was born, I was given a Zulu name called Kala Lega. And it means cry, laugh in Zulu, if you know the language. And he began to just minister to the deepest part of my soul, really just touching a nerve and settling all the questions that I had. And, and that really launched me into a season of just incredible prophetic experience for two years. Almost every time I stepped into a church building or a meeting, people would prophesy over me and begin to speak of this call over my life and this invitation of God for more. And, and I guess, in a sense, he just took a very timid, very small, very shaky 
little girl and put like fire in her bones um, and began to just expand my understanding of God. And yeah, and so I've been on a journey since then. There have been many, many twists and turns. Um, but the Lord has just marked my life. And it's just, I've been absolutely changed from that day onwards. And so that's a little bit of my story. Mm. And yeah, is that that's good? That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Let's give her a hand. Eh? Thank you very much. Before we go on with Mark, do you want to just stand up for a moment? Just greet somebody near you. Just stand up for a moment. Just take a moment to uh, orientate yourselves in community. Yeah? Right, you can grab your seats again, guys. Really, I just want to say thank you so much to the worship team for leading us this morning in that lovely time of praise and worship. And, and for Bronwyn and uh, who is it, Amy and little, little Hannah as well, coming to dance here in the front. Thank you for that. Sue, thank you for the time that what you bring in the freedom of worship as well in terms of dance. And wonderful we can be expressive of our faith to the Lord and our love for Him, eh? So, so important. Why don't we reach out our hands towards Mike and just pray for him. Father, thank you for Mike and for Julia. Thank you for what you're doing in their lives as well. And we pray that this morning as they stand amongst us and just share what they found in you, that it would be like fresh water in a dry and thirsty land, that we would soak it in, receive it, and it would produce multiple fruits in our lives. So bless them in this time of sharing in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's so, so good to be with you, Julia. You, you, know, you wonder why, why I asked her to go first. Well, it's clear. Um, I can't, can't match that too, too well. So hopefully I'll, I'll pick up pieces a little bit. But uh, Julia and I have been married for a few years. And five weeks after our wedding, we moved to the UK, which people tell you not to do. Uh, they tell you to keep things as stable as possible, as um, safe as possible. And uh, we were in the middle of COVID, and we had already lost our wedding originally in the April um, of 2020 because COVID had taken out those first set of weddings, which included ours. And, and so we'd already been thrown into the unknown. We'd been thrown into a, a space of not having anyone else who'd gone through this to help us to navigate it. And so for six or seven months, we waited uh, to get married, and it was, a, it was a difficult time. It was an unknown time. It was unprecedented in our generation um, we, our generation is typically thought of as being a little bit uh, soft, uh, and that's possibly because we haven't gone through any major crises uh, on a national or global scale that has impacted us uh, all viscerally or individually, and this is something that has impact, impacted us. We've tried to navigate it, but it's unprecedented, and, and so we had to uh, go through that together, but we felt God calling us. We felt God calling us to go to the UK, uh, that, and that only once we arrived would he show us and what we had uh, to do there for him. And that's quite a daunting place to be because in COVID, everything was unpredictable already. We're then moving internationally five weeks after we've been married, which is incredibly unpredictable, all of those things. And we moved without a job and without an income, and yet we felt God calling us. And, uh, and I'll share a bit more of, of that story later, but there is something exciting about following Jesus. There's something incredibly exciting about following him. You... You never know where you'll end up. You never know where he will lead you. And yet there's something about getting to know him, getting to know his character that makes decisions like that possible. When you get to know the person you're following, even if you don't know where you're going, you're willing to go because of the character of the one who's calling you. And so my experience of life in my 33 years of life, 17 of them following Jesus um, as closely as I possibly can, is growing excitement in following Jesus, 
growing excitement in following Jesus. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Dave kind of gave me a, a blank canvas. He said, you're doing a five-month series on, on Jesus. And I thought, okay, well, that's very beautiful and vague and broad. And what do, I, what do I speak about? And as I was sitting with it, I felt God say, I want you to talk about this call to follow. This call to follow uh, Jesus. Is that okay? Can I, can I do that this morning for a few minutes? And the truth is we all follow something or someone. It's not just religious people and folks who follow something. We, we all have someone or something that we place at a significant point in our lives, usually at the center of our lives, that acts as a reference point for other things that is in our lives. And ultimately, that is the thing that we are following. And if we go a step further, that's the thing that we ultimately are giving worship to. If worship is what we give our time, our talents, our attention, our finances, our day-to-day -day thoughts to, then uh, ultimately the thing we're following is the thing that we end up worshiping. But for a lot of people today, church and faith and, and religious organizations feel a bit odd. They don't quite get it. So you walk in this room and, and people are dancing and they're raising their hands and they're lifting their hands up into the sky. And, and you know, some might walk in here and go, what, what in the world is going on over here? People are lifting up their hands. There's something on the roof. Like, is the, is the roof on fire? Are we all supposed to, as part of worship, look at one spot on the ceiling? You know, who, who knows uh, what's going on? Everyone just calm down a little bit um, to make me feel a bit more comfortable. I, uh, when I was in the UK, I had the opportunity to go and watch my favorite football team play, uh, Manchester United, in case you're wondering, um, play Arsenal at Old Trafford. Um, and... Uh, just for the record, they won, um, in case you're wondering. And also on the record, they probably haven't beaten Arsenal again in the last four or five seasons. But at least they, we won the one I went to go and watch. And as I was sitting in this incredible, beautiful stadium, filled to the brim, 70-odd thousand people, I suddenly had this very interesting experience. I started to look around. I started to notice the signs. I started to notice what was happening. And, and as I looked, I saw one banner that said, M-U-F-C a religion, Manchester United Football Club, the religion. And then another one that said, Manchester is my heaven. And then I looked a bit closer and I saw everyone had hands up uh, in the air singing their favorite worship songs for their team in support of, of their team. And I, I suddenly realized this is not so different. It's a different place, a different context, but there seems to be a lot of common cause here that people are gathering around in some kind of religious devotion, or at least that's how they understand what they are doing. The truth is we all worship. We all worship something, someone. The writer David Foster Wallace said, everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. Atheist writer, the only choice we get is what to worship. And we follow what we worship. We follow what we worship. So this language is part of our daily lives. I'm following this person on X or Twitter, if you're not up with a change in name or Insta, or Snapchat, or Facebook, or the latest health expert, or fitness guru, or YouTube influencer. We're all, we use that language constantly of following, of followers. Interesting. So it's not a question of if, but who or what we are following. And here's the crucial point. If we are following, we are being led somewhere. So where does what we are following lead us? Where have you been led up to this point in your life on the basis of what you have chosen to follow? If we're following, we're being led. So some, if, if not most of you in this room, would say, I'm, I'm guessing that I'm a follower of Jesus. So what I'm hoping you will get today from this is to hear the call afresh from Jesus to follow him and choose to say yes again and again. And again, wherever you are in your life stage or season. If you're here this morning and you're still checking out the claims of Jesus, I pray you'll hear the power and the love in his call for the first time today. That's my hope for this morning. So here's how I want to approach it. I've got two questions I want to answer. The first is, what is discipleship? And the second is, what does it mean to be a disciple? I want to answer these two questions. What is discipleship and what does it mean to be a disciple. And I want to read from Matthew 4, verses 17 through to 22. So I want to, I want to just 
throw up a map for you so you can see. Sometimes when we think about Jesus and what he said, we kind of put it on par with some kind of like folk tale or thing that happened way back when, once upon a time. No real historical context. But, but this happened around Galilee. Galilee is a real place in the northern part of Israel where Jesus launched his ministry and performed many of his miracles. So when we're reading what he's saying, he said this in a physical place, location to particular historical people. So I want us to hold that in our mind, and I want us to hold what it might have looked like when Jesus might have said these words. So here's a picture uh, next of the places that Jesus might have walked and spoken these things to crowds. This is the, the Galilee area. It's actually very beautiful. Reminds me a little bit of the Eastern Cape. I've been driving for days, it feels like, through the Eastern Cape. Incredibly beautiful place. And that's, you know, sometimes hard for a Western Cape person to say. But Eastern Cape, <laughs> I'm convinced. I'm convinced. Okay, so let's read together. Maybe holding some of those things uh, in our minds from verse 17, chapter 4. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called to them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. This is God's word. I pray that he would speak to each of us where we are today with the word he has for you this morning. So that first question, what is discipleship? Very simply, from this original moment of Jesus calling the very first disciples, we see that Christian discipleship is following Jesus. It's to follow Jesus. So that might sound really simple, but I want to dig a little bit deeper into what that actually means. So I don't know if you know this, but the New Testament was originally written in Greek, and the translations we have are brilliant English translations of that original version that was written down. And this word disciple in the original Greek language is methetes. And it describes the relationship of a pupil to their teacher. So what would happen is students in the ancient world would approach a master and ask to follow them to become like them. That's the process. It was a really common practice. It was present in Greek philosophy. Greek teachers, as well as, as well as Jewish sages, had disciples. So a helpful way to think of this is like apprenticeship. Apprenticeship. A novice learning the trade from the master to reproduce the master's work. Although the ancient understanding of discipleship actually carried more weight than this. So, for example, uh, in Judaism, the apprentice would imitate their rabbi to the point of mirroring the exact sum of steps taken on the Sabbath, the same amount of time in meditation and memorization, the treatment of their spouses and the raising of their kids, etc., etc., you get it. One chose a respected teacher to become like them in every area and in all things. This is what's in the mind of those first century uh, Jews who Jesus was calling. They knew exactly what was happening. They knew the invitation that was being given to them. As a physical outworking of this process of apprenticeship, it was proper etiquette for rabbi's disciple literally to walk behind his teacher. You could tell who the disciples were because they were in a line behind the teacher, following the teacher. So if we could just cast ourselves back, place ourselves in that first century world for a moment... And we ought to be engaging and looking and seeing what's going on. It would not be uncommon to overhear one pupil say to another, may you be covered with the dust of your rabbi. May you be covered with the dust of your rabbi. May you be so close to your teacher that even the dust from his walking on the dusty roads would cover you. It's powerful. This is the understanding of discipleship that would have been in those first century Jews' minds when Jesus is calling them. 
And so in our text today, we see two powerful insights about Jesus' approach to apprenticeship. The first is this, Jesus calls disciples. See, in the ancient world, it was common for disciples to approach a teacher and ask if they could be their teacher. But what we see is Jesus reverses the cultural norm. He goes and calls his disciples. This is what he came to do, to seek and to save, to seek people out, to break into their space and their world and call them to follow him. So what we see is the humility of God. That God who existed in all glory before anything was created takes on human form, comes into this world and says, hey, come, come and follow me. And it also speaks of the dignity of human beings. That God longs for us to know him, to draw close to him through his son. So that's the first thing we see. Jesus calls his disciples. And the second thing is Jesus' call is to follow me. Follow me. Why does the first commandment end with have no other gods beside me? You ever thought about that? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and have no other gods beside me. Why, why is that included in that? Because it is very easy to set up God as the one we worship and then to set up all manner of other kinds of little gods around him that we give our trust and our loyalty and our affection to. Very easy to do that. We tend to set up and to serve functional gods in our lives alongside the one true God. Jesus says, follow me. And what that means is we have to resist being a fan. There's a difference between fans and followers, a huge difference. He has enough fans. He has enough people who think he's a great dude, a good moral teacher, a kind person to emulate with your morals. That, that's fan talk. That's fan speak. What Jesus is calling for is followers to commit to being a follower, to walk behind him, to become like him in all things. We're called right into the center of the grit and the beauty of Jesus' ministry. That is the calling. And so our definition of discipleship off the back of what we've just been talking about, I think, is this. Christian discipleship is our continuous yes to the call from God to learn from and become like Jesus in all things. Christian discipleship is our continued yes to the call from God to learn from and become like Jesus in all things. Or memorably put by former Archbishop of York, John Santamu, who said, when you squeeze a lemon, you get lemon juice. When you squeeze a Christian, do you get Jesus? When you squeeze a Christian, do you get Jesus? The truth is the world is compelled to consider Jesus if his church has been with him, following him. The dust of our rabbi on us, the fragrance of our leader and our teacher on us. And this leads to that second question. What does it mean to be a disciple? What does that look like? How do, how do we grow in that? How do we do that day-to-day -day work? It's nice to have a concept in our mind, maybe inspiring to think about it in a new way, but how do we actually do it? How does it meet real life as we live it day-to-day? -day? And I think the answer to that is giving our yes to Jesus in a long obedience in the same direction. Yes to Jesus in a long obedience traveling in the same direction direction. Psalm 84 verse 5 says, blessed are those whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. So in this world, we're not tourists. We're not here just to take in the sights, beautiful as they are. we pilgrims. So there's a purpose and a trajectory to our lives not defined by the surrounding culture that we find ourselves in. So as Christians, we're not world haters. I ho hope you know that. We don't hate the world. Remember John 3.16, God so loved the world? Sometimes when you listen to Christians, it feels like that verse actually reads, God so hate the world. But he doesn't. He loves the world. And he sent his son to save the world. So we're not world haters, but we shouldn't be too at home in this world either. That we forget that our primary citizenship is from heaven. So discipleship is a pilgrimage. 
As Eugene Peterson referred to it in his book, it's a long obedience in the same direction. It's a great book, by the way. Highly recommend uh, reading that if you haven't yet. So how do we respond to this call and become faithful pilgrims in this long obedience? The first thing that I think will help us to do this is to recognize the different discipleship seasons that we find ourselves in. Sometimes we just live life as if it's a continuation of the same thing over and over again without any discernment of change, without any discernment of how God is speaking to us and leading us in different seasons that we find ourselves in. But the reality is that God is a God of seasons. God leads us in different seasons. And we need to be asking the question, God, what are you doing in this season of my life? What, what are you up to? How do I discern what you're doing? How do I speak to people in my community? How do I be, be part of a church to work that out? Mike Breen writes a book, uh, and he speaks about the rhythms of life. Drawn from John uh, chapter 15, where Jesus talks about abide in me. Abide in me, and you will bear much fruit. But there's also pruning in that process. There's growth in that process. So where do we find ourselves in this process of abiding, of uh, pruning, of growth, and of fruit. And this is the cycle that we find ourselves in. It starts with abiding, sticking close to Jesus. It moves to pruning, where actually God wants to bring growth to our lives, so he cuts off things that are not enabling growth. Growth then happens. We bear fruit, and then the cycle repeats again. God calls us to himself, and we abide. We then are pruned. We then grow, and then we bear fruit Repeat, repeat, repeat. So where are you in this stage in your life right now? What season are you in? I often find I struggle. There's times in my life I can remember struggling so much to hear from God and feeling like I'm, I'm, there's just friction in my life. And I felt God whisper to me, it's because you're trying to live in this new season like you did in a previous season. But this is different. The same things don't apply in the same way. I'm wanting you to listen for what I have for you in this new season. Have you ever tried to bear fruit, but actually God's calling you to abide? There's a real friction there, and it's not like these things are mutually exclusive necessarily, but they are seasons God has us in. And the way we grow in discipleship, the way we grow in following Jesus is not recognizing the seasons he's leading us in and through. In every season, there's an invitation In every season that we're in, there's an invitation. So what is that invitation in this season for you? If you were to think about where you fit in that abide, prune, grow, bearing fruit, where are you? Where are you and what's the invitation? Are you feeling that friction, that disconnection? Perhaps it's because you're trying to live the principles of an old season in a new season. And at some point... In our faith journey, we are going to hit what people have called to have called the wall. We're going to hit the wall. That's Pete Scazzaro's um, image from his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. And he, he, he describes something that I had never understood as being an important part of growing as a follower of Jesus. We get to a place where we just feel like our prayers make no difference at all, where we're uninspired to read the Bible, where we wake up and we wonder, where is God at all in my life right now? That's a scary place to be. If you've, if you've ever been there before, you'll recognize that. If you're there right now, you know what I'm talking about. It seems like God's presence has evaporated from your life. You couldn't feel more distant All the things that worked before to connect you to God seem to fail or fall short of doing that. What is going on in this kind of a season? How do we talk about this as the church? This is a really important part of following Jesus. We will get to a place where we hit a wall and we have an invitation to let go of power and control. To let go of power and control. In 2016-17, I... um, I felt God say to me, I want you to study the biblical understanding of waiting. So if God ever tells you to do something like that, you know that you're about to go into a season where some kind of waiting or perseverance is required. But I thought, that's great. It's like, I love Bible study. 
I'm keen to do it. So I went through the entire Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, and picked out every verse that was relevant to what it looks like to wait on God, to wait on the Lord. And I started to uh, look at every text, every verse, and build an understanding biblically of what it means to wait on God. And sure enough, I hit a season where I needed to learn to wait. I started to feel cynical. I started to wonder, why do we do the things we do as Christians? Are we even changing? Are people changing? Relationships are so complicated. They always seem to, people seem to let you down. I started to feel cynical. I started to feel overwhelmed with the sense of, what, what, what am I doing with this Christian life? Where am I going? Is it going anywhere? And I felt like God encouraged me to wait. I felt like I'd hit that wall moment. It's a scary place to be, but it's a moment that is so crucial to our faith. And there was one verse that I studied in that season of waiting that said, God works on behalf of those who wait on him. God works on behalf of those who wait on him. And the word wait and hope are the same word in Hebrew. Those that wait on the Lord or those that hope on the Lord. Which one is it? It's both. Those that wait on the Lord, those that hope on the Lord will renew their strength. But we're so keen on instant results and satisfaction that we haven't learned how to wait on God to form us, to invite him to speak into those areas that are are needing to be pruned, to be broken off. We're so keen on the experiences um, that we can have with God that we don't quite know what it looks like to wait in stillness on God. But it's key for our following of Jesus. He has to get us to a place where we are willing to give up our power, our self-control, and to fully give him our trust. To give him our trust. See, we so easily want to go around things, but God is intent on leading us through things. Why? Why is it that God so often leads us through, but not around? I would love it. If God snapped his fingers and led us around really difficult things so we didn't have to go through it. But what we don't get, what we don't get if we forfeit the throughness with God is we forfeit the intimacy that is developed in those seasons with God. If we want intimacy, if we want to cultivate trust in God as our leader and our shepherd, we have to be willing to go through the valley as well as enjoy the pasture with the shepherd. Think about that process of Psalm 23. It kind of mirrors our experience of being a Christian. You start in the pastures. It's all wonderful. The grass is green. The the sky is blue. You become a Christian. Everything feels so clear and beautiful. God's presence is there. Your prayers are answered immediately. It feels like everything is, is wonderful. It's incredible. And I take nothing away from that. But you can't stay there. We have to grow to maturity. We have to grow to a place of trust. And so the shepherd of Psalm 23 leads his sheep from the pasture, through the valley, and the result is the table, the table of fellowship. See, it's once you've gone through the valley of shadows and you've learned to trust the presence of the good shepherd that you are able to sit at the table of fellowship and enjoy the shepherd even more. He is a good shepherd. He's either the God of every season or he's not the God of any season. He's the God of every season, not just the exuberance and the excitement, but the moments where we're processing loss and suffering and difficulty. He is the God who leads us through, and we need more than inspiration. We need more than inspiration. We need to be persuaded that he is faithful, that he is faithful and he can carry us through. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite uh, writers, and he has this um, amazing analogy of the Christian life as being like a house that God is building. And uh, this was incredibly powerful for me in this season of feeling like I'd hit a wall and was waiting on God to lead me through. And he says, when we become a Christian, we, uh, we understand that some work needs to be done on the house, right? There's some leaks, there's some tiles missing on the roof. God starts to fix some of these things that are obvious, that are wrong, and we praise him for it. We're grateful for it. And we go, that's great. I'm happy. Let's leave it there. You know, it's good work has been done. Uh, let's, let's move on uh, to the next thing before it really gets a bit, uh, a bit intense. And C.S. Lewis says, no, well, then you start to hear all manner of banging going on. 
and, and suddenly a, an extra wing is thrown out to the house and, and a second floor is, is developed. And, and he says, no, 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 the problem was you were expecting God to build a little cottage in which you could enjoy uh, your, your safe experience of life and of God, but he is building a palace in which he intends to dwell. He is building a palace in which he intends to dwell. Do we trust the master builder? Do we trust the pruning knife in the hand of a father? See, it's scary if someone comes with a pruning knife and they don't know, we don't know who they are, we don't know their character, we don't know their qualification, but if it's in the hand of the father, we can trust him. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. And he wants us to know that he is there, that he is trustworthy, that he is faithful. So the first thing that's going to help us in this long obedience is recognize the different discipleship seasons that God has us in and ask, what is the invitation in this season? Second thing is we need to pay attention to our formation as his disciples. We don't become full of Christ-like character and power by accident. It doesn't happen by accident. James uh, Smith, who's a Christian philosopher, he wrote an amazing book called You Are What You Love. The title really says it all. You are what you love. We are most formed by what we most deeply love. We're most formed by what we most deeply love. Our loves are emotion. They, they pull us and drive us towards things. And so our loves move us in those direction, in that direction. So 1 John 4.19 says, we love because he first loved us. So we need to pay attention to our formation by retraining our loves, by first knowing we are loved by him. And secondly, we retrain our loves through counterformative practices, practices that we engage in daily that produce the character and the fruit of Christ through the leading of the Spirit. So we need to pay attention to our formation. Becoming Christ-like doesn't happen by accident. So this long obedience is not going to be easy, as I, I think is, is clear from what uh, I've said so far. Distraction or discouragement will come. It will come. And here are two very real potential distractions or discouragements that I'm aware of. I want to mention these two things, and then we're going to finish, and I want to make some space for God to move and speak um, as we pray. So here are two potential distractions and discouragements to this long obedience that, that are top of my mind right now. And there's many we could mention, but here, here are two. And firstly, we've spoken about the call of Jesus to follow me. A potential distraction are rival calls from other people or other places in our lives. So our culture, and sometimes if we want to start our own hearts, tell us to put ourselves at the center of our lives. Forget God, forget eternity, uh, live for the moment. You know, YOLO, you only live once. Make the most of your life by keeping yourself at the center. And Augustine has a very harsh diagnosis for this kind of thinking. He's that fourth century African bishop. He said, actually, the human heart is an idol factory. It's like a factory that churns out idol after idol after idol and sets it up next to God. New gods to worship, success, illicit sex, reputation, wealth, status, whatever it might be, we're continually churning these things out. The problem, as C.S. Lewis says, is that idols break the hearts of their worshippers. They, they hook you for long enough to take enough from you for you to end up broken. They keep promising something, but you never quite get it. But they have a hook that keeps you going long enough to shipwreck something, if not your faith in some significant aspect of your life. Idols break the hearts of their worshippers. The Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows springs of life. What we need is a well-kept heart. A well-kept heart. So we need to pay attention to our hearts. We need to invite God in. We must tend to our hearts because if we don't, rival calls come in and steal our attention and our affection. We need to recognize what competes for our attention and affection and ask, is what I'm following worthy? 
So potential distraction or discouragement is a rival call that feels uh, compelling and powerful in our lives. And we haven't dealt with roots of idolatry or bitterness or unforgiveness. These things can, can grip us and take us places we didn't want to go. Remember, if we're following, we're being led. Where are we being led to? What calls are we following? A second potential distraction or discouragement that could come our way is rival beliefs in our culture that don't hold to the kingdom teaching that Jesus has given us. A relation once said to me, I don't want to become, well, I actually said to this family member, what, 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 what is the one thing that keeps you from trusting in God? So maybe you want to ask someone that question in your life. I don't know, but I feel like it gets to the heart of it. And she said in response, well, I don't want to become a Christian because I believe that I'm going to lose my freedom. I'm going to lose my freedom. So we're in a culture that elevates this personal freedom to the most important and greatest virtue in our day. It's like the one thing we can agree on. We all must stay free. As long as we all agree on that, anything else goes. And God is seen as this kind of cosmic thief who comes and steals and robs and, and takes our freedom away from us. But Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. So which is it? Can you see the tension here? Is God for or against our freedom? Which is true? There's a rivalry that exists in these two statements. What's the problem here? The problem is that our culture has a fragile understanding of freedom, which goes something like this. I want, I want what I want, when I want it, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else in the process of getting that thing. So if I can eliminate all limits, I will be free. What I need is unhindered self-expression, and then I will be free. But a stronger understanding of, of freedom is, is out there, and I think that's what we're given um, in the Christian faith. Freedom is living in accordance with our design. If God exists, which I hope most of us believe he does, but you know, let's say for argument's sake, we're not sure, but let's say he does. If God exists and God created everything that we see and don't see, then surely as the designer of all things, he knows how they work best. And so when God calls us into things, it's not so much a no to steal our freedom or rob us of our joy. It's because he knows how that thing best functions. And when we function in accordance with the designer's design, we are free. There's another kind of freedom here. The calling to follow Jesus is in fact a calling to be the most free, truly human person we could be because we're living in accordance with our design. So we need to be paying attention to the rival beliefs around us that, that can compete, become um, hindrances and blockages in our following of Jesus. And in the midst of these rival calls and beliefs, comes the voice of Jesus, and he says, follow me. Follow me. So Christianity is not just a set of teachings to believe. It's a way to follow, a person to follow. We follow the way of Jesus. We follow Jesus himself. I want you to notice one other thing before I close in, in prayers. Notice where Jesus calls these first disciples. He calls them in their vocation. He calls them as they are fishing. He calls them in the vocations in which they are occupied and repurposes those vocations for his kingdom purposes and effectiveness. So where are you based? You don't have to leave your current location. You don't have to leave your current job or where you are at your stage of life to follow Jesus. Yes, there are things he will ask you to put down in order to follow him, but the reality is he wants to use us where we are. He calls us to follow him where we are, and he says, what's in your hands? They were fishermen, and he wants to make them fisher of people. So Jesus is calling you where you are. Follow me. So what were those two questions we asked at the beginning? What is discipleship? I think really simply, it's, it's to follow Jesus. It's to keep close to Jesus. It's to keep our eyes fixed on him. It's to notice where rival calls and rival beliefs start to diverge from the path that he's calling us to walk on and to come back and follow him. 
Maybe some of us need to come back to following Jesus this morning. We've become distracted. We've become hardened. We, we became disappointed by the wall or by the loss or the suffering that we experienced. And Jesus' voice is coming to you today, and he's saying, follow me. What does it mean to be a disciple? It means to give ourselves individually and communally to a long obedience in the same direction, to set our course and to follow him, to keep to that course and to be okay with slow work. I'm all for charismatic moments as a breakthrough and God doing something immediately, but there's a, there's a reality of, of having to work that stuff out over days and weeks and months and years and don't become disappointed or disillusioned if it's sometimes slow work. We're not about making progress. We're about following Jesus. He brings the fruit. He brings the fruit. So I want to just, I want to make a, a moment uh, for us to pray and respond uh, to this. So I'm hoping God's been speaking. I'm hoping that something has landed in your heart this morning. That's what he's wanting to say to you. And so I want to invite the Holy Spirit to come and minister to you. So can we, would you mind standing with me for a moment if you're able to? I'm going to invite the worship team up as well. And Julia, if she can. So if you're comfortable, would you just close your eyes uh, with me? It's not, I'm not going to throw anything at you. It's just, we're able to focus for a moment undistracted. If you're comfortable to close your eyes and open up your hands if you want to get into a posture of receiving. I want to pray for us. I want to trust the Holy Spirit to come and, and ignite what he's been speaking through his word. So come, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you have been speaking through God's word, your word. And I ask that you would ignite that word right now in hearts and minds. Thank you that you're here. Would you increase your presence in this room right now? Come, Holy Spirit. I was praying for this time, I had a real sense that God had specific things He wanted to put in your hands this morning. So as your hands are open, just ask the Lord, what is it you want to put in my hands today? there's some people this morning who've just been caught up unintentionally you're, you're a disciple of Jesus you're loving him you're following but you've just got caught up in sideshows you've lost sight of, of him you've f- fallen a bit far behind just to use an imperfect analogy of following him you, he's in a distance you can see him but he's a bit far away and I want to sense this morning of God saying come back follow me give up those distractions set down the idols come back Thank you, Holy Spirit. We just make room for you this morning, God. Thank you that you always come. Just allow the Spirit, there's this clear sense of his presence with us this morning. Just allow him to do what he needs to do. I just had a sense that there's some of us this morning who maybe resonated a little bit with what I shared and And it feels like that following Jesus moment happened a long, long time ago. Um, Maybe it was a childhood, yes. Maybe in your teenage years, maybe your early 20s. But it, it feels distant and it feels like almost like that was good for then. But it doesn't, doesn't feel like it still grips me. And I felt the Lord just say like it's, it's never too late and it's also like never done. It's never over with him. And I felt he wanted to reignite something that that feels maybe a bit dusty. He wants to sort of dust it off. And it doesn't matter where you are in your life, how old or young. 
God wants to use you and He wants to fill you afresh and He wants to give you a fresh revelation of who of who He is. And, and there's something about seeing Jesus rightly, seeing Him again with fresh eyes. And so if this is resonating with you this morning, would you just respond maybe by putting your hands in front, maybe close your eyes just so you're not distracted and, and ask the Lord, would you give me fresh eyes to see you rightly this morning, Jesus, that I would know what it means to follow you even in this stage of my life. Thank you, Jesus. I've recently become a mother and I am challenged every day. <laughs> by the distraction. And I've noticed that my son, he looks for the shiny thing, constantly wants my phone. And God's been saying to me, Judah, stop looking for the flashy, shiny things. Will you pursue the real thing? Will you give everything to pursue me? Will you give everything to seek my face? He's the only one worthy of our full attention, friends. And He wants to fill your gaze. He wants to fill your mind. He wants to fill your relationships. He wants to fill your parenting. He wants to fill your grandparenting. He wants to fill every area of your life with His good presence. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, if, 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 God is, if God is moving you this morning, some are already coming, but just there's a sense to just come forward. Sometimes we've got to do a physical thing, and it's just a response. If you want to come forward and just get before the cross, just have space. I'm sure there are people who can pray for you as well. If you need specific prayer, there's room and there's capacity for you this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. Shoulder. Yeah, if there are mothers in the room and that's resonated with you, if you just feel distracted and tired, like you don't even have a second for yourself, how can you find God in this season? I would love to pray for you. He longs to be found. He longs to be found. He longs to be found. Thank you, Jesus. Sure. We're going to sing a song in response, but I wonder if, if that is you and you need to come forward for prayer. I, I feel like I've got lots of energy to pray for people today, so I'd love to pray for as many people as I can. Other leaders will come forward and pray, but sometimes just going and kneeling before the cross is an incredibly powerful moment of surrendering again, a physical act. So if you need to do that this morning, I would encourage you to physically go to the cross kneel down before it and say, Jesus, I, I need you in this season. If that's you, just don't worry about anyone else. Just come and kneel. If you need prayer, come, come receive prayer. Just come. Come right now. You're welcome. As we sing this song, we'd love to pray. I want to make space for what God's doing this morning, just for a few more minutes. So let's sing together, and, and we'd love to pray for those who love prayer.
opening up a whole new season. It's a season of fresh encounter with him. Some that have walked a long, dusty road with him, but the Lord wants to bring refreshing in your life. If your walk with Jesus has, has lost its, its luster, its, its sparkle, its, its life, He wants to invite you back into that place of just renewing your first love, your experience here, engagement with Him. So we, we invite you not to be in a hurry to leave this place, but to come, take some time, just to kneel before the Lord, maybe you receive prayer. Maybe just on your own before Jesus, allow him to come. Maybe for some, I just feel like uh, some life has been a very safe, conventional thing. The Lord's calling you to be willing to take risks in his name. Because following Jesus may land you in risky places. But that's where the life is. That's where the life is. You feel like you're, you're open to, he, to say yes to his call. I want you to come up here. I'm going to pray over you. And it may be pertaining to you. Something with the way your lifestyle has been going, your family lifestyle, what goes on in your home, and you know it's a time for a, a remake, it's a resh- reshaping of that. That's why we worship Him and while we stand before Him. You feel free to come up and we'd love to pray with you, bless you, and see how, what God's going to do in you for this new season. If you come here with a need for prayer for healing, we already prayed for one lady's healing right there. If anyone needs healing, you're welcome to come love to pray for you as well. We'd love to just spend some time bringing you before the throne of grace, see what God's going to do. Amen, amen. And you, you know, our meetings don't really end. It's only finished and the last two people say goodbye. So it's all part of the flow. Huh? So you're welcome to enjoy just fellowship together, tea and coffee. Uh, enjoy that. Come back in the evening if you'd like to come and soak a little more. Lovely things going on in the evening meetings as well. You can come for six o'clock. Actually, they produce supper here. Uh, and take away supper in the, in the kitchen. You're welcome to come for that as well. God bless you guys. And we're going to pray for those that are lingering around the front. See what God's going to do in their lives. Thank you. If you're visiting us, please make yourself known. We'd love to connect. If you're visiting, don't forget, you can come and give us your details and get a free cappuccino. We'd love to support you. And community. Thank you.